still have all these COVID restrictions. Tonight, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Some Yukoners speak out against restrictions. Well, authorities say the pandemic ain't over till it's over. They first ripped the purse out of my hand, and that's how they broke my finger, because um, I held on to my purse. More allegations about store security profiling customers, this time in Alberta. Our Lake Whitefish fishery was the third largest in North America before Manitoba Hydro showed up. And as long as the rivers flow, a provincial utility goes for permanent authority over northern waterways. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin in Ottawa, where today Justin Trudeau announced more military aid for Ontario specifically in Toronto. The province is the hardest hit by the third wave, which Trudeau says is still growing strong. But officials had some promising news for First Nations communities. Jimmy Pashkumskum brings us this. The Prime Minister said COVID is continuing to ravage Ontario and help is on the way. Let's be clear. Sending men and women in uniform to help in Ontario is a serious step. We're doing this because the situation requires it. Public Safety Minister Bill Blair also said 62 health workers from federal departments across Canada will be sent to Ontario. As the Canadian Armed Forces is also deploying nine ICU nurses and up to three multi-purpose medical assistance teams. In addition, the Canadian Red Cross is prepared to deploy an initial group of 13 nurses with ICU and emergency uh, response experience and they are prepared to deploy up to 30 additional resources. On the vaccine front, Canada will be receiving the first doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine within the coming days. And starting next week, Pfizer will deliver 2 million doses per week. Dr. Theresa Tam says vaccinations are going well, especially in Indigenous communities, and Indigenous leadership has played a big part in that success. With increasing vaccine uptake, Active COVID-19 cases have dropped more than 80% in First Nations communities in the past three months. It is enormously encouraging to see how vaccination is serving to protect higher risk communities. Trudeau is encouraging everyone eligible to get their vaccine. When it's your turn, make sure you book an appointment to get your shot. Sophie and I got our first doses of AstraZeneca on Friday. We're feeling great, we're feeling more protected, and we're also feeling like we're part of the solution going forward. Health officials say Canada's vaccines seem to be pretty effective in protecting against the COVID-19 variants of concern, which are driving this third wave of the pandemic, but they're not 100%, and people still need to observe public health guidelines. Jimmy Pashagumska, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Health officials in Quebec have announced the death of a 54-year-old woman from a rare blood clot. They say she had received the AstraZeneca vaccine. Quebec has given out more than 400,000 doses of AstraZeneca so far. And there have been four cases of rare blood clots, either linked or possibly linked, including this fatal one. Health Minister Christian Dubé says given the 1 in 100,000 people incident rate, Quebec will not change the province's vaccine strategy or use, or use of the AstraZeneca shot. We were expecting to have those complications with a certain number. Uh, it, it is within the, uh, the, the number of person that, we, that could be affected. We are in that number. That's very unfortunate and we are sad about it, but that's, that's the price of vaccination. Health officials say there is always a risk, a risk from COVID itself and a much smaller risk potentially from vaccines. The Yukon is one jurisdiction leading Canada when it comes to pandemic management, though it isn't stopping some people from getting frustrated with strict restrictions. As APTN Sarah Connors tells us, the Yukon's chief medical officer says an easing of measures is right around the corner as long as people play by the rules. <laughs> At this protest in Whitehorse in early April, the message was clear. Enough with COVID restrictions. 
The Yukon has only had 81 cases of COVID and two deaths, with the latest being a Yukon resident who contracted it outside of the territory and died from unrelated health conditions. But there are still strict restrictions in place, like the mandatory two-week self-isolation rule when entering the territory. That restriction has limited travel in and out of the Yukon. Now, people like Clayton Thomas, who is Taltan, say enough is enough. We have no COVID here, and we still have all these COVID restrictions. If we had 200 cases, or whatever the number is, then we should be acting like that, and then we wouldn't all be here. But we have nobody here, or we have no cases, so we'd like to act as if we have no cases. I know that most people do uh, do support what we're doing. But so the Yukon's uh, chief medical officer of health says restrictions could soon be easing, as long as Yukoners continue to get vaccinated. We need to hang on for a few more weeks, uh, maybe months, but uh, I think once we're in the summer, I'm quite optimistic that we'll be able to make significant changes to our, um, our quarantine measures. He says there's also the issue of new COVID variants, some of which the Moderna vaccine might not protect against, meaning restrictions need to stay in place for now. We are at risk, at, at as high risk as we have ever been for importing cases of variants and we're still susceptible to that to spread of COVID, particularly variant COVID within the territory right now. Yukon chiefs are voicing their support of Dr. Hanley's measures, like Chief Doris Bill of Kwanlin Dunn, First Nation. You know, we have a limited health care system here in the Yukon and uh, we can't manage a huge outbreak. If that were to happen, we'd have to send people south. And you see the hospitals in the south now filling up. Generally, there's been um, a lot of support. A lot Chief of, Christina Kane um, of Ta'an Quachin Council is also voicing her support of keeping the current measures in place. She's encouraging Yukoners to keep getting vaccinated as it's the way out of restrictions. We really can't afford to let our guard down right now, especially with um, the third wave. So um, we're not out of it yet, but, but you know, there is, there is hope for the future, for sure. Meanwhile, Dr. Hanley is encouraging Yukoners to persevere and that the end is near. Just like spring is coming, the end of the pandemic is coming, we need to do our best, hang in there. It may be a matter of weeks, you know, before we get to, uh, to a really good place. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. British Columbia now establishing travel restrictions across that province. Many leaders and human rights advocates are concerned how it will affect Indigenous people. APTN's Tina House has that story. With 19 cases spreading across BC, the provincial government last week enacted travel restrictions to stop the transmission of the virus. Based on the advice of the provincial health officer, I'm restricting non-essential travel into or out of all health authority regions in British Columbia effective immediately. Indigenous leaders like Chief Don Tom had his concerns about that and says there was no consultation from the province. He says many Indigenous communities in B.C. are rural and have limited space in hospitals. He is hopeful that these restrictions will help, but disappointed they did not have a say about it. We're seeing uh, numbers continue to rise, and so um, with some of these travel restrictions, I think what we'll, what the data will come in in a couple of weeks and we'll see the success that it, it, it will have and the impact it will have. In a letter sent to the B.C. government by the Union of B.C. Indian Chiefs, B.C. Civil Liberties and others, Executive Director Harsha Walia also expressed her concerns. We continue to have several concerns regarding the serious constitutional and privacy issues at stake, as well as the potential harmful impacts of this order on Indigenous, Black and racialized communities. The province says those restrictions could be lifted by the May long weekend. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. Well, we'd like to hear what you think about the pandemic restrictions where you are. Here's how you can continue that conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories.
In other news, a woman from the Enoch Cree Nation says she was assaulted by security while picking up groceries at an Edmonton Walmart. APTN's Chris Stewart has more. Desiree White Morin is a mother of four and 125 pounds. On April 7th, she says three Lost Prevention officers detained her. She had picked up an online order and had paid for a turkey at the register. He just right away started accusing me of stealing merchandise. And I explained to him, um, like asked him what was it that he thought that he was accusing me of stealing and he was saying it was uh, cosmetics. And that was the thing is that I didn't go near the cosmetic aisle whatsoever. She says two of the officers then got physical. They first ripped the purse out of my hand and that's how they broke my finger. Um, because I held on to my purse that they didn't have any right to take it from me or even to search it. And also um, when they did that, they dumped out all the contents. Like one grabbed me and held me down. In the end, they let her go. She says she lost her medications from her purse. This is not the first alleged assault at the Walmart located on Stony Plain Road. In 2017, a bystander filmed two security wrestling with the woman outside. One had their knee on her neck. APTN contacted Walmart Canada. They did not respond to questions asking if the loss prevention officers were Walmart employees or hired from an outside company. They did release a statement which reads, We are aware of an incident and that police were contacted. We are looking into the incident further. Respect is a core value at Walmart Canada and we do not condone any behavior which contradicts this value, including racism and discrimination. Walmart is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment for our associates and our customers. Celebrating diversity and fostering inclusivity is an integral part of the Walmart culture, and we are proud to reflect the diverse communities we serve through our associates. White Morin says she doesn't want to file a police report on the incident but will find another store to do her shopping. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Time to step aside for a quick break. Still to come, why a community continues to push back decades after a hydro development uprooted them. Everybody was told they had to move. Many of the community managers didn't want to move, but they were forced to relocate. Welcome back. A Manitoba hydro project in the northern part of the province that's been operating for almost 50 years is still facing backlash from the community it impacted. Now targeted billboards and bus shelter ads are calling out Manitoba's Minister of Conservation and Climate. Daryl Stranger has more. Billboards like these have been placed around Winnipeg. They're paid by change.org and are about an upcoming decision from the Manitoba government regarding the Churchill River diversion. Manitoba Hydro has been operating the diversion since the 1970s. It diverts water from the Churchill River to generating stations on the Lower Nelson River. Decades of interim one-year licenses have been approved by the province and now a decision is nearing in regards to a permanent license being granted to Manitoba Hydro. Chief Shirley Ducharme of Opipina Peewin Cree Nation says the province has not properly consulted the community about the license and the Churchill River diversion. We are saying as a First Nation, for so many years we have been, you know, trying to uh, get the consultation that we needed. They are saying, yes, your First Nation has been, you know, consulted, but we don't see it. It's not full. It's still, there still needs to be ongoing consultation and to, you know, uh, help us, uh, like, give us a say on what happens uh, uh, in the future for us. The Manitoba government will also be making a decision on giving a permanent license to the Augmented Flow Program. That program, which has been around since 1986 and is approved yearly, changes water levels and flows on Southern Indian Lake to also power generating stations. Leslie Dysert is the CEO of the Community Association of South Indian Lake. He says the community was forced to move and eventually the fish populations will be depleted as well. 
everybody was told they had to move. Many of the community managers didn't want to move, but they were forced to relocate. Uh, it's collapsed the Lake Whitefish uh, population. Uh, our Lake Whitefish fishery wa was the third largest in North America before Manitoba Hydro showed up. Jim Senka is a former Manitoba Hydro worker and worked for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans at South Indian Lake. He described why raising the water level is an issue for the water and the community. The problem with raising the water level of, of a lake is, is that the water comes into contact with new soil it's never been in contact with and, and those soil have got um, heavy metals in them like mer mercury is the one that showed up the most but so and they're going to end up in the, in the water. In a statement, a spokesperson for Conservation and Climate Minister Sarah Guillemard said a decision will be made soon. Quote, the minister is currently reviewing the consultation summary materials and is expected to make a licensing decision in the coming weeks. Manitoba Hydro said in a statement they are committed to working with communities. Quote, Manitoba Hydro is committed to working with Indigenous communities to address historic and more current concerns regarding hydroelectric development. Senka added, Hydro needs to put the people first. It's a really big thing for those people. It might be big money for Manitoba Hydro, but it, it, we have to think about people first. Along with the billboards, an online petition is also calling for the minister to not approve the final license, and it has garnered over 50,000 signatures. Gerald Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. Meanwhile, news is out of an agreement in principle reached with mining giant Rio Tinto ILC, but it's upset members of two Inu communities in Quebec who say they weren't properly consulted before chief and council signed on the dotted line. In 2014, the two Inu communities initiated a $900 million lawsuit against Rio Tinto for destroying ancestral territory. APTN obtained a copy of the signed agreement from Rio Tinto. It states the two have agreed to drop the previous lawsuit in exchange for annual compensation and a percentage of future mining profits. Band Council officials have not officially confirmed whether it has been signed and have ignored APTN's interview requests. But one community member is worried. Où on va aller cette entente? Où on va... C'est quoi le... C'est quoi le bénéfice par cette communauté, les deux communautés qui touchaient? J'ai questionné plusieurs fois, moi aussi, parce que si euh, on a signé cette entente, et m'a dit que ça va être pour 50 ans. Mais si tu gardes 50 ans, c'est loin. A series of stunning videos posted to Facebook captured an overnight fire as it raged through a historical church in the Mi'kmaq community of Listigouche on the Quebec side of the New Brunswick-Quebec border. The St. Anne's Catholic Church reportedly went up in flames around 9.30 p.m. on Monday night. Three firefighting squads responded to the call, but the church's bell tower eventually collapsed around 1 a.m. Tuesday. The 100-year-old church is now believed to be a total loss. The cause of the fire is still unknown and an investigation is underway. And there's sort of a, a heavy feeling in the community right now and survived multiple generations of, of people in the community. Um, you know, we, we've all got different connections, not just, you know, um, from sort of the religious aspect, but it, it was for a long time the center of the community in terms not just physical geographical location, but in terms of events and, and community gatherings. Time now for another quick break, but stick around. There's more to come. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Today's photo was submitted by our viewer Francine Paul. She captured this image along the trail in Vermilion Park, located in Dauphin, Manitoba, the so-called City of Sunshine. Be sure to take a photo while you're out and about and send that photo to share at aptn.ca. You might be featured as our next photo of the day. Let's take a look now to see what tomorrow's weather forecast is looking like. 
Starting on the East Coast, plus 9 and showers for St. John's, 16 in Halifax. Minus 1 with snow in Inukshuak, flurries and 3 in Kujuak. 11 with showers for Montreal, 14 and partly cloudy in Shibugamu. 10 with rain for Sault Ste. Marie and North Bay. 13 in Thunder Bay, sunny and 16 for Sioux Lookout. Plus 2 in Thompson and God's Lake, 3 with showers in Norway House. 18 with rain in Winnipeg, 8 with showers for Dauphin. Chance of snow and a high of 12 in Regina, 13 with the chance of snow in Saskatoon. Plus 3 in snow in Meadow Lake, 1 with snow in La Ronge. In northern Alberta, 4 in high level, 6 with snow for Fort McMurray. 20 in Medicine Hat, snow and 12 in Edmonton. Showers and 14 in Vancouver, rain and 1 degree warmer in Victoria. Plus 1 in Fort Nelson, 9 in showers for Prince George. Plus 5 in Old Crow, 2 in Whitehorse. Minus 6 and snow for Yellowknife, plus 1 and snow in Wrigley. Minus 7 for Saks Harbor, 6 below in Pulatuck. Minus 9 with snow in Chesterfield and Whale Cove. Minus 5 in Resolute and Joe Haven. An all new episode of Face to Face is just minutes away. Our guest tonight is the First Nation Sensation, former pro wrestler Wable Starr. Starr spent time wrestling in the WWE, the big league in the business. But when he first started out, he was worried he was going to embarrass himself and others. So if I was not going to be any good, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to misrepresent my family or any you know band members from Star Blanket or any, you know any other indigenous people. So right off the bat, when they asked me what I you know I, I came up with a name. I, I just said, "Call me Donnie Mac," and uh, that Mac, uh, sorry, that name was just kind of neutral. And uh, I picked the place, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, it was just you know so I could be just a generic wrestling guy right off the bat. Uh, uh, fortunately for me, after those first couple of matches, I did feel that uh, I was on the right path. And I uh, decided to start using my real identity after those first two initial matches. It's a pretty fun episode with Wavell, and you can catch it in about two minutes' time. That is all the time we have for your AP10 National News for this Tuesday. Tune in tomorrow live at 3 p.m. Eastern as host Melissa Ridgen puts police accountability in focus. Important episode there, too. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.